thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I think our topic today is going to be fairly interesting. It's a great lead in from the prior speaker where he's going into the ins and outs of lean. Today, our goal and our hope is to give you a little bit more of an overarching background around it, as well as the real life applications of, of what that looks like in the field with our owners. Uh, our topic could take up an entire conference. I mean, that's how big Lean is, as you've seen. Um, Lean was actually first coined by Lori Koskela in 1992. So that was only 30 years ago, so it seems fairly recent. But there have been tremendous advances made in this space and understanding what Lean is and what goes into that toolkit, if you will. Um, for perspective, there's a huge incentive for our owner companies here to make investments in transitioning to over to lean construction. You're seeing, um, according to McKinsey study, 10 to 25% cost savings on projects, and projects are 10 to 30% faster. That's tremendous value for an owner company. But pay attention, there's also a requirement here around looking at value driven. And one of the biggest changes is shifting your perspective, whether it's from how you do the work or the contracting around it, it's more value driven, meaning we're moving away from this tendency to low bid. And we're looking at what's that high value. So union, union contractors, union labor, people who are highly skilled in what they do and what they bring to the table. And I think that's an important point to talk about. We're making work transparent through lean construction. We're making sure that the information is going upstream and downstream. So that's both ways. All the trades are involved in this and making this work. Reach, reaching those savings in that goal. It's simply not trying to just optimize one piece of the process. Lean is looking at it as a whole. So all those moving parts that are going around together translate into something greater. So some, the sum of the parts, yes, they inform it, but you're not gonna try to drill in and try to squeeze something out of a trade or a contractor without looking at the larger perspective. And I think we can all agree about that. We are looking at many different tools in the toolkit. So that includes integrated project delivery, pull planning, big room, uh, and innovative contracting practices like integrative form of agreement. Today, our panelists are gonna talk about what that means for their organization and how that ties into those objectives. And I think you're gonna be able to take away some good value in terms of how you approach your work and communicate about it, and also elicit the respect that is deserved to the people who are doing the work on the projects, because this new approach requires the collaboration of everyone involved. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dan Kovac, who has tremendous, feel, uh, tremendous experience around this, and he's gonna talk a little bit more about the definition of lean. Thank you, Mona. So you mentioned 1992, the term was coined. But uh, however, I believe at least in my career, everybody has worked towards lean and did not know that it was called lean. For example, everybody's been looking at the benefits of it. How, how do we improve productivity? How do we reduce costs? How do we boost morale? How do we improve safety? This has all been done way before the term was coined. So looking at the goals though, there's many other benefits. Besides increasing productivity, you reduce rework. Right? You can improve design. And what's near and dear to my heart is doing, allowing time for constructability review. So while my entire career has worked towards this, the, the last seven years I've really spent towards constructability. But how did all this start? Fresh out of college, 1982, I'm working down at Hope Creek Nuclear Power Plant. I'm a civil engineer. I see rebar being installed in a containment wall. Some of you may have been on that project from the New Jersey area. And, and I'm looking at this number 18 bar going in, and, I did all the design of rebar, and we always had development splices. Right? Why are they CAD welding this? CAD welds are expensive. That's what my professors told me. So I talked to the foreman on the ground. He says, go on up and talk to the guys. So I climbed up the rebar, talked to the guys, and I said, how come you're not doing a development splice? Why are you CAD welding? They said, very simple. They said, you know, the development splice, and they were absolutely right, on this number 18 bar would have been over 12 feet long. So think about that. All the extra time that would take just to make that development splice work where the CAD weld, one and done, you're done. Eye opener to me, right? I learned early on in my career, you don't know what you don't know yet. I did not know that, right? So that got me thinking. Trades, they got some great answers. So I learned how to talk to the trades very early on, and I did that my entire career, especially whenever there came up problems. 
about 25 years ago, this was very effective. We were assembling a steel girder assembly for a deck. They're 50 foot long girders, uh, several of them running parallel on top of concrete piers. They had to be bolted down. A lot of cross beams were, were put in there and a lot of X bracing. Great design, but if, like everything else, it looks good on paper. The iron workers are struggling to get this stuff together. It just doesn't assemble right. They put it together, they took it apart, they had to put a beam and they took the beam out. They actually wound up taking the girders off the concrete piers, try, just trying to assemble all the cross beams and then trying to slap it back together, bending anchor bolts, but it worked. It took something that should have been done in three days, took over four weeks. That's how much had rework had to be done. Waste of money. So, me, myself, the way I like to talk to people, I talked to the guys. I said, hey, what was the problems with this? And they told me. So I pull out the drawings, takes, took down some notes, and listened to them. We had to do this four more times. Not right that year, a couple years later, because we're finishing this, this substation. I talked to the engineering firm, and I said, hey, we got a big problem. This took way too long to do. Here's what I'd like to do on the, on the changes going forward. Had all ears. This engineering firm was great. They listened to me. They listened to the, wrote down all the notes, changed the design. The end result was two years later, we assembled one. It was done in one quarter of the time. Some of the guys that were on the first one were there. And they said, oh, this changed. They really appreciated it. But it was from the input, right? Could not have been done without the input of the iron workers telling me what needed to be done. Another issue. We're building a lot of New Jersey where I'm from, very tight real estate, very hard to find, very high electrical demand. We have to build substations and, and switching stations all over the state. So as a result, with compressed real estate, we're using GIS equipment, gas insulated equipment, can build on a small piece of property, but a lot of large concrete slabs have to be done and a lot of bridge cranes. So in the concrete slabs, there are column beam uh, in, in beds to put the bridge crane on. The embeds themselves have well, maybe 18 to 24 Nelson studs on there, six inches on center. The rebar mat in the top was number nines at nine. You think there's an interference? Iron workers would get done putting all the rebar in, carpenters have the forms up, they're starting to hang the embeds, iron workers gotta come back and start untying all the rebar. Just to, and just to try to jockey around all these Nelson studs. So talk to the iron workers. What do you guys wanna do? What, what can make this better? Suppose we put the rebar to match the centering of the Nelson studs. We can go in between. Set of number nine's at nine, number 11's at six. Solve the problem. Then you take it one step further. The carpenters even said, hey, we have a mud mat of concrete down here to, build, to put all the rebar on. Suppose we laid out the embed on the mud mat, so now you can actually transfer that directly up and make sure that there's zero rebar interference when these Nelson studs have to drop in. It was a game changer. So, and we're putting these slabs in constantly for the past 15 years and everybody realizes a big benefit. It only came from, from folks in this room, from your suggestions to us. Very good reaction from our engineering firms. They all accept it, except one. This is how not to respond when you have a problem. We had to build a two, two large, well, one large lattice tower structure, two legs, about 60 feet tall, 20 by 15, and a 60 foot beam between them. We had a one day outage to assemble this, to, to erect it, I should say. So we assembled it on the ground first. So you guys are out, we allowed about a week to assemble. You guys are out there, you're putting it all together. I'm looking at the drawings, I fan ahead to see all the assembly. I realized the designer never closed the top of the box, if you know what I mean. Nothing fit, there's no way to hang the beam, no way to close off the top section as we're bolting them together. I called up the engineering firm. I said, we have a problem. You know what they said to me? Are you sure you know how to read a drawing? We don't make mistakes. And, and I said, what? They said, no, our engineers don't make mistakes. You're not looking at the drawing right. So I said, listen, this was Wednesday. I said, we have an outage on Saturday. The stuff does not go together. We have a couple ideas. Send your engineer out. Well, it's gonna cost you money. I said, I think it's gonna cost you money if we can't put this thing together. Engineer came out. He actually looked at the drawings himself and realized, he said, I know exactly what you're talking about. How can we make this work? I said, come on out. Let's talk to the guys. We went out. You guys had great suggestions. Let's move some gusset plates. We'll do some welding. We'll do this and we'll do that. And we had plenty of time. End result. We did all the fixes, he marked up the drawings, he approved everything, and we met the outage, we said it. Only because the input from folks like you in this room. That's lean construction. That, that's working the best, eliminating rework, and making everything come out good. So we've learned that over these years, especially for my career, that increasing the productivity comes directly from the folks doing the work. And what I've been focused on with constructability, I now lead for the past seven years a team of engineers and we look at drawings way ahead of time. 
for constructability. Doing all those reviews, what I just talked about, larger scale. I got millions of stories to tell you about how effective you guys have been helping to us. But mainly, in that constructability review, we worked with our AE firms. And working with them, and listening to them hear the problems that we've encountered and how they can change their design has been tremendous. There is a very high degree of collaboration with all of our AE firms in getting the design done, except for the one I just mentioned before. They no longer work for us. Well, this is an excellent example, Dan, of the real life, uh, real life applications of lean construction. And I think collaboration is an important segue into what Jerry Grisham is gonna be talking about at Southern Company, which is a very important approach that is a fundamental concept of lean. So Jerry, please enlighten us. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. And so again, uh, my name is Jerry Grissom and I serve as the external labor director for Southern Company. Now some of you may not exactly know who Southern Company is because we're really a long, long way from Southern Company's traditional footprint. You know, we're one of the larger utilities in the Southeast, uh, primarily electric and now we're, we're into the gas market in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi. Uh, we have gas in Georgia, we have gas in Tennessee, we have gas in Virginia, and also we have NICOR in Illinois. And, and we also have renewables that sweep from Texas all the way up to Washington State. And so really Southern Company really has assets in about 20 to 25 states, depending on what day you count and which day we're adding and or maybe selling some assets. And so when you look at that, we're a pretty big company. We average around 63 million man hours a year of skilled trades labor. And around 71% of that is with organized labor. And we're very, very proud of that. Uh, again, so for us is our success as a company is based on what the iron workers do, the other building trades do for us. So we could not be the company we are without you. And so before I go any further, I just want to say some thank yous to our contract partners that, in, that are in the audience. Without you, we are not who we are. And I also want to thank the, uh, specifically Melvin Brewer. He is our international rep. He does a phenomenal job for us. He helps lead our culture. He helps shepherd our contractors and our labor partners. So Melvin, thank you for what you do for us. I know there's also some business, man uh, business managers in the, office, in the audience. Thank you for what you do for us too. I didn't really say much about my career, but I started in the manufacturing industry working on a shop floor in manufacturing. Well, now I've moved over into uh, working in the construction side and now work in, in labor relations. And lean concepts in manufacturing are very, very different than lean concepts in construction. You know, lean in manufacturing, you're based on precision, it's based on consistency. It is a science because you're trying to remove any inefficiencies throughout your process to get a perfect product to move into the next phase. Construction is nothing like that. You know, so we really focus on, you know, construction is around the art of lean and it's working through problems. You know, so we try to help with our work with our labor partners and our contractors collaboratively around a couple of things. One is we know that things are going to happen. Fill in whatever word you want to say there, but stuff happens. Things don't go as planned. And so for us, it's we want to control what we can control, which is being aware that things are not going to go as planned. You know, when we start working with our contractors and we build what we'd say is a collaborative nature and spirit for our contractors to have contingencies, as you were talking, Dan, on constructability, we ask our contractors, and this is one of the things I would say is a best practice for doing work in our system, is we ask our contractors, what are your contingencies going to be when things go wrong? For example, when you go out and you're trying to procure labor, because right now labor market is tight, when you don't get all the labor you're looking for, now what are you going to do? And when that doesn't work, now what are you going to do? And when that doesn't work, now what are you going to do? So just as an example of what it looks like for us when we do a review of our uh, competent core contractors is what is the depth of your contingency planning? And for us, we believe that is a secret sauce for us and our contractors. You know, secondly, I'd sit there and say the thing that we really focus on inside Southern Company, and this is, is one of the things that is near and dear to our heart, is we really focus on kind of the ecosystem of greater good concepts is that we're all in this together. And ultimately, we, we want everybody to have a great Christmas, right? But us as an owner of a regulated utility, we're here to provide low-cost energy to our ratepayers. We also want, at the same time, we want very competent, very financially sound and profit driven and 
uh, you know, high profit margin contractors. At the same time, our contractors want skilled, competent, qualified, safe workforce that comes works for them that in turn is, is paid a good, meaningful wage and those individuals in turn populate the communities that we're trying to serve. So it really is an ecosystem here where we all work as a balance and we really have what I call a self-governing ecosystem to keep things in balance because for example, if a contractor comes in and gets a little bit frisky and they try to start squeezing blood out of a turnip with our labor partners, that really upsets the ecosystem and it doesn't really work for us. And so just as, as a, uh, a, a word of advice to contractors is be conscious of the culture you're going into because for us this ecosystem of us working with customers, working with ratepayers, working with contractors, working with labor partners, it's all got to work together. Absolutely. Very well said, Jerry. And that's exactly the spirit behind lean construction. Perfectly put example. Will, uh, please tell us more about um, data-driven decision-making around lean. Why are you implementing it, how that works? And I believe there's a slide that's going to go up here in the background to illustrate one of your points. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Jerry, ecosystem is a great, uh, great word to say about lean construction because it really is about the whole process. It's about everything that happens. Um, you know, Matt had a really good presentation earlier, and one thing you could probably take away from this event is that technological, technologically wise, and some other areas, construction really is at the we're at the tail end or we're remaining flat. And I think this. Um, illustration is is another good illustration of that the, for the last 25 years construction has been very stagnant when it comes to productivity and that's why Williams kind of went down this path so I'm Will Sutherland with Williams uh, Williams companies we move about 30 to 40 percent of the United States natural gas uh, at any given point during the day uh, we're about a, about eight billion dollars in revenue um, and I've been in the industry, oil and gas, third generation, in 25 years specifically it, and in my career. And from working out in the field to where I'm at now with Williams, we've seen a lot of things and we've seen a lot of changes. And what we've recently seen is data-driven decisions. And that really goes into the lean process mythology and, and thinking through it. So, you know, Dr. Dan Damming talks about you can't manage what you don't measure. Right, and if any of you are in the, the audience actually read uh, Dr. Dan Deming, he may not even be contributed to that, but he is attributed with that quote. And what it means is that, you know, for a long time we've been collecting all of this data. Uh, I mean, whether it's on the work site, whether it's in the back office, whether it's the owner, whether it's the contractor, we're all collecting massive amounts of data, right? And then not only that, we have a couple of people that are managing that data and they've been making these amazing spreadsheets and they've been telling upper management, hey, this is what we've got going on in this area. This is our productivity in this area. But the issue with that is that we didn't really engage the culture of the workforce when we started talking about that data. The people that were making and having the biggest impact on productivity and what was happening at the work site were real secondary to the data and information that we were gathering, right? So you have, you have the foremen, you have the laborers, you have the operators, you have everyone out there that is really contributing to the project's success or failure, but they're not in the loop of the data. So, you know, as we change that, that culture, what we've seen as a company especially is all of that data is great and we all need it, but we have to translate it. We have to translate it to management so they can make decisions. We have to translate it in a more real-time scenario to the field, to the work phase, so decisions can be made on lagging issues out in the field, right? And not, not in a way of, hey, this is the latest spreadsheet on tab eight. If you look down here at the bottom of cell 773,000, no, what we need to see is red, yellow, and green. You're green, everything's good to go. That crew's working is as efficient as they can be based on what we're doing out here in the field. Or you're yellow, you know, where's the caution here? What, what do we need to look at? 
what's, what could give us some consternation coming up, or red, we're having some issues right there. So engaging that culture of having the work face involved in the data and, and having the data in a very easy to understand way is critical to lean mythology, it's critical to owners, it's critical to contractors, and to the skilled labor out there. One other thing that we've seen is, you know, Brent kind of talked about this at lunch the other day. I think there is some cultural changes when it comes to the data as well. The people that are coming up now are more adept at using data, they're more adept at seeing data, managing it, and, and but what we've really seen from them is that they're much better at telling a story with it, right? Because they've been managing it for so long, it's been a part of their childhood, growing up in school and everything. They're used to seeing that all the time and they can explain that to someone, right? And that's, a, that's another key component. But I think the last key component to, to data and lean and, and especially from an owner's perspective is really experience still is there for the action. Right? The, you can have as much spreadsheets, but the spreadsheet isn't gonna get the work done. And you have to have the foreman, you have to have the superintendent, you have to have the work face engaged in understanding what the data is showing so they can take action. Because if, you know, again, a spreadsheet isn't gonna get the work done, we have to have the people ingrained into the culture of, hey, this is the data, this is what it's showing you, what do we do with it? You know, like, how are we going to recover this project? How are we going to recover this steel erection based on you know, these three lagging things? We have to have that foreman, whether he's key on data or not, to give us the action plan and to give us you know, what his skilled craft are going to do to recover that. And that's something that if you take anything away from data and lean is how do you get more involved in it? and be comfortable with it. Be like, hey, I want to be a part of understanding what's going on so I can collaborate. Uh, someone yesterday had a really good, uh, she was talking after Diana Carnes and um, she mentioned peers. Like we have to have those peer discussions about how lean is affecting your job site, how lean is affecting your company and how lean is affecting the skilled craft. Thank you, Will. That's very relevant, timely discussion today about how are you using that data and what that actually means. It, it's, it, data always comes off as this amorphous topic, but it's really cascading down into all of these concepts that we talked about today. And How do you use it and how do you engage with people around it to make it real? Alonzo, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alonzo uh, is with GM and they have been noted for implementing a lot of these lean toolkit concepts into their work. Um, today we've talked about many key topics that you'll touch on now. I'd love to hear more about integrated forms of agreement and your contracting methods, modularization, and many of the advancements that we're seeing now at GM as you prepare for that more competitive automotive future. Okay, no, thank you, Mona. So Alonso de Avila, I'm with General Motors, uh, based out of Detroit, uh, currently working in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Uh, and I represent the, the joint venture between General Motors and LG Energy Solution out of South Korea, and we're working on four uh, ultium cell battery manufacturing plants in the United States. Um, what's represented is our future is electric. We're not just competing as a company, but we're also competing with multiple countries around the world. Our, our company's committed to having 30 electric vehicle offerings by 2025, and we see a future of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. That's our goal and our, our mission statement going forward. Um, Ultium 1 is in Lordstown, Ohio, and will be producing cells this year. Ultium 2 in Spring Hill, my project as the manager, is in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and will be producing cells next year. We just announced Ultium 3 in Lansing, Michigan, and the fourth is yet to be determined. There's at least four of these. Each one represents a $2.5 billion investment. Each one of these represents 2.8 million hours of construction, men and women working in the field. Um, so these projects, as we've gone along, have gotten bigger and our time has gotten shorter, right? The, the expectations of meeting the market demand and beating our competitors to the market is incredibly high. Uh, this is our modern day space race for us. So lean can't just be something we talk about, it's something that we have to live every day. I do want to give, uh, you know, because I was, I was asked to definitely highlight 
the iron workers in Spring Hill, Tennessee, but also how far north we're going. Uh, local 147 out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. Local 25 out of Detroit. South side, uh, the south side of the United States is represented by uh, local 92 in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, east of the country is uh, Knoxville, Tennessee and Kentucky. And we have iron workers from as far west as local 378 here in California, represented on the projects that we're currently working on. So e each one of these projects represents a giant investment. Even if it's a joint venture where GM is only paying 50% of it, it's still a, a significant amount of money and a significant amount of investment. Uh, uh, there are market escalations, price escalations, but then there's also outside actors. A Amazon has no problem buying the steel bar joists of the market for the next three years. They're, they're a competitor, right? They're in that same market that we're in, trying to tap labor, trying to get the right materials. And so the way we looked at Lean and, and progressing through the different projects that we've had, and, and they've all been successful, collaborative design build works very, very well, but taking it to that next level really was an integrated project delivery method. So I'd like you to imagine a project that's a company and the company you're, you're a shareholder in, you're a stakeholder in this company. There's integrated forms of agreement with multiple parties. So as the owner is a party, the general contractor is a party, and the trade partners, not contractors, not subcontractors, trade partners uh, are represented. Imagine an owner that's willing to represent and provide you your direct costs at, at the wage rates, your indirect costs, and your percentages of overhead and markups, guaranteed. The profit is represented in its different percentages by the different trade partners, but it goes in a risk and reward pool as part of this project. All profit is at risk and at reward. All of a sudden, you're incentivizing the parties and the shareholders by not increasing the cost of a project, but really by coming up with innovations. We represent and, and we establish an expected cost of the project. We then set a target that's lower than the expected costs. Every dollar that's saved from expected to target is split 50-50 between the owner and the trade partners. So it's, it's basically taking our, our model of design build or even worse plan spec and really flipping it on its head. People are incentivized to drive costs down all of a sudden you start seeing innovations where a steel contractor can help a mechanical contractor by sharing hangers, by, by coming up with some really innovative solutions to some really complex problems. And we're not arguing anymore about, did you have it in the bid? Did you miss it? Did I not put it in the scope? All of a sudden, we're, all of that goes away. The litigation that comes with that on the worst case scenarios doesn't happen anymore. The profit is at risk, but really there's a lot to be gained and rewarded. And a contractor and a trade partner doesn't have to worry about the big loser project they get once every five years anymore, right? They get to worry about how can I be as innovative as possible and how can I drive costs down to help all of the shareholders, all of the, the risk reward partners. And there's payouts at those different milestones, in closing the building, uh, for, you know, getting that first sell out the door. All of those come with payout periods and, and basically incentivizing people to meet the dates of the schedule. So there's risks, obviously, but there's also great rewards. Um, the integrated project delivery method is, has really shown us what, what we can do and, and how it, Lean can really translate into a contract. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I haven't looked at the contract since it was written because I haven't had to. Uh, a project of this size and magnitude would normally have hundreds or maybe even thousands of RFIs. I can count the number of RFIs with one hand that we've had on this project. You can't tell the difference in these cluster meetings and in these big room sessions and these collaborative environments that we've built between the mechanical contractor, the mechanical trade, you can't tell, and the engineer of record, you can't tell the difference of what company they represent, on what silo they represent, and what corner they're from, because they're working together to try and make the best solution for everybody. Um, so it's really the future, um, I, I really think We've got four uh, integrated forms of agreement right now uh, for each one of these uh, uh, Ultium projects. And I really see it as, as really there's no going back. And honestly, the, the change that's happening as, as drastically as, as it's happening with technology and uh, battery cell chemistry and the manufacturing processes is, is just so great. We're going by leaps and bounds, changing things to, make th to, to, to increase range, uh, to increase you know, uh, cold weather performance and mid-cycle performance 
of our batteries that this is the, really the best model that we've been able to come up with. Uh, in a traditional fashion, we'd be paying a lot more. You wouldn't be making as much. It, it really is a mutual benefit to everyone. Um, from a modularization standpoint, I want to promote a, a session that we do called Choosing by Advantage. Uh, please look it up. Basically what it does is I don't want anybody to think that modularization solves all problems and that it's the perfect fit every time. You have to have a business case and the Choosing by Advantage session allows you to go through this business case to sell it to everybody. You have to sell it to all the shareholders that this is the right thing to do. Um, and you really look at the pros and cons, material availability, uh, the labor availability, um, but obviously standardizing work and having a controlled environment where you're uh, doing a lot of the work off-site is definitely advantageous. It definitely focuses your efforts in the field. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I definitely also want to uh, encourage you to talk to owners and clients about their payment terms. The reason I say that is because for the longest time, our payment terms was, was for work installed and in place. If those are the terms, you are never going to modularize on a project because there is so much upfront costs and you're doing stuff off-site, you're not going to get paid until it gets put on the site installed. So the payment terms of an owner may be cost prohibitive or prohibiting us from doing modularization. Have those conversations. Talk about upfront payments. Talk about the discounts that come with paying a, a York or a train or a manufacturer to, to modularize and go to a skid model or to, to have a shared rack hanger that's made in a shop. Payment terms are probably the single biggest reason why we're not lean. I'm gonna say that again. Payment terms are probably the single biggest reason of why we're not doing lean more often. So I, I wanna leave you with, with that kind of uh, knowledge, but honestly, we've, we're not looking back. Um, we're competing as a country, and I, I really feel like it's, it's for the better, and I, I really thank the trade uh, the ironworker trade that's really kicking ass on my project right now because structural steel is my critical path right now and, and we wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you. Alonzo. Yeah. I have a quick question on the I IPD. I, I think it's a great way to, uh, you know, we talk about ecosystem, we talk about how everyone's a team on that. But, you know, a lot of this conference, we've talked about cult workforce culture, right? We've talked about wanting to come attracting workforce into the labor market, how is that IPD, how's that job site feel, right? Is, is, what's the team aspect of that job site? Because it sounds to me that it really takes away a lot of those things that we used to have to deal with and it seems like it'd be a great work site to be at. Yeah, so there's a couple of examples I have. Um, bringing on a, a trade partner sooner does so many things for us. We're able to talk to the new cores and the Volcrafts in Alabama and their shop about getting our steel and getting the order, the mill order, and getting in the queue as soon as possible, as early as possible. Another example I have is, you know, we, we saw some, some examples of lean with United Rentals. So we have an agreement with one single rental company for the entire job. We pool all of our rental equipment. Think about all the different contractors in a traditional job site that have their own equipment, that are charging their own equipment, that, that's idled, there's a lot of waste there. Pooling for one gives you a lot of great advantages. One, you get better rates than you ever could on your own. Two, it uh, allows you to have consistent equipment. You're not thinking, oh, is it a mobile mini? Is it a JLG? Is it, is it something that I gotta get trained on? It's more consistent and it's probably the best uh, maintained equipment we've ever seen on a project because we're getting the best uh, from United Rental or Sunbelt or whoever we pick as our, our overall rental company uh, because they're on site all the time. They're, they're handling the entire site's equipment. Uh, another example I want to share about how to be lean and, and really save money is listening to the tradesmen, going to the tripartite meetings and listening to the men and women on your job that say, you know, Spring Hill's great, but you know, I only get a half hour to go out to eat. Bringing in food trucks every day of the week on our job site has increased our productivity. So th those are the simple little things. It doesn't take you reading the book and uh, you know, having, having all these numbers memorized. There's, there's very tangible things you could be doing on your respective jobs with the respective relationships you have on those job sites to have tangible results from some fairly simple things. So uh, the other example is there's a chief operating officer of Ultium. Makes way more than I do, uh, but he's, he's writing multi-million dollar orders and checks all the time. And I noticed he was scanning, signing, 
or I'm sorry, printing, signing, scanning, and emailing back every single order. And, and we got to Ultium 3, and now we're at Ultium 4. And I, I kind of stopped him after a meeting one day, and I said, hey, can I, uh, can I show you how to get your digital signature set up? He came to me the next week and says, I am three times more productive now that I don't have to be printing this out, scanning this, and sending this. Those are the simple little things, a digital signature, a food truck. They're, they're minor, but they really translate to tangible things that, that end up making a job site uh, much more favorable. Uh, we're, we're constantly looking at how can we give people better parking spots? How can, we, how can we make it a workplace of choice, right? We're competing with a lot of other manufacturers, a lot of other job sites, and we need the best talent. How do we do that? It's, it's pay, and it's good pay, and through the national maintenance agreement, we, we ensure that. But it's really through those other more tangible things. Having a, a mile walk to a job site is not a good solution, right? Finding those solutions is really important. That will make you lean. It, it, it will work for you. So you brought up some really interesting points around. It, it also improves the lifestyle of the person working on the job at all different, all different types of work. And that's the core. That's behind the 10 to 25% cost savings on a project and a 10 to 30% savings on schedule. So these are, not, um, these are not soft concepts, but these are measurable, impactful changes. So I wanted to open up the floor to questions from the audience. You're now invited to come out and ask our panelists more detailed questions about what they've just described. So Mona, while, while they're coming up with questions, I want to address something that Will brought up about productivity. I go to CURT conferences, CII conferences, and, and I hear Steve Mulva or Greg Sizemore talk about how construction's been stagnant in productivity for the past 20 years, and Will, your slide I think shows that from the data. But I want to challenge you guys with the question, and you ladies out here. Think about how much your job has changed in the past 20 years to what you used to do in regards to safety. We instituted tailboard meetings, 15, 20 minutes every day, at breaks, coming out of a break, coming after lunch. So you have like maybe three or four of those during the day. You're not productive. F just safety in itself, putting on harnesses, putting on belts, looking for your tie-off point, making sure you're doing all this as you, as, with your normal task. But you're, you're still turning out the same volume of work. So has your productivity increased that we're not measuring properly? Because you're in introducing safety into your job now more than ever before. So, so I, I, I challenged Steve Mulva on that, and he actually said they, they never really considered that aspect of it, because safety takes a lot of time, and it's well worth it. Absolutely. So, so thank you very much for all you guys, your acceptance of the safety standards that, that we insist on as an owner that you have to have, whether it's drug testing, whether it's JHA, so thank you. And so I'll just add an, another thing. So Alonzo, when you, you, you were very clear because you said it twice, what's the impediment to lean? And I would maybe look at the other end of the spectrum because every one of us up here has specifically talked about collaboration, asking a lot of questions, building a partnership, working in an ecosystem. And so you know, maybe I'd sit there and say one of the greatest uh, force multipliers in lean is a focus around collaboration, a collaborative spirit, a working to listen and understand with empathy from everyone who has, has to touch any piece of equipment all the way to the engineer. And so I may say that's the force multiplier of lean is a collaborative spirit and a focus on the greater good. And I just have to tell this story because I believe this is, it's, it's important to us in, in our system as an owner when you have contractors and labor partners that are willing to work collaboratively together versus being so competitive with each other, they don't, they're not willing to share. For example, I've heard stories, and it happens fairly routinely inside our, our, our system, is we have contractors will compete against each other for a job one particular week, but the very next week they turn around and have each other's back. And then when they deal with labor challenges, one contract, in fact, laying off or, or sharing labor that would be on critical path for another contractor. And that doesn't happen just by happenstance. It happens when you have this concept of focusing on the greater good and we're all in this together to, to make things better for us as the owner, for the contractors that are trying to, to construct projects, and for the labor partners. Great. Great. 
I want to make sure we're not missing any questions. If there's anybody that has a question, please come to the front microphone if that's possible, or just raise your hand so I don't miss you. All right, do I have a gentleman over here? I believe that's Mr. Brown. Yes, yeah, Mr. Brown. It's Will. Yes, sir. All right, Alonzo. Hey. You said the P word, and we're on, we're on a bunch of your sites right now, and we're at Dinah Spring Hill, actually. And uh, the pay element for our contractors, when we hear stuff like that, and I'm not trying to encourage all these other contractors to go down to General Motors, but <laughs> it, it, it does work and it's great. And we really, especially on these big, large projects like this, and the timeliness of the pay, it's all great. And it's uh, the pooling of equipment and working, uh, well, the Nashville local has been great, and we're crowding them out because you've got Midwest, you've got us, you've got Barton Malvo, you know, you've got all these ironworker employers down there, and we're fighting for the same labor pool. Uh, but it all worked out, and I think a lot of that was because of the collaboration with the owner straight to the union and saying, hey, here's what we're doing, here's the program, you tell me how we're going to do this, and I think so far, that district council and that local union have done a great job. So I agree. And, and it's, it's wonderful I, working with a company like that. If I, if I could add just one thing, in Spring Hill, Tennessee, it, it's probably our, it is our biggest plant from landmass in, in terms of the amount of, of area, square, uh, acreage. Um, but we made sure to stagger out our projects in Spring Hill. We knew there was a battery electric vehicle, the, the Cadillac Lyric. We knew there was a new paint shop and we knew there was an Ultium. And we made sure to stagger enough so that we could try and keep the same labor force busy for a longer duration of time. Having that flow and basically that, that commitment to a, a, a tradesman or women that, hey, this is kind of a long-term deal and we've got a plan for you from the Bev program to the paint shop and from the paint shop to Ultium uh, makes, it, makes a great deal of, of, of you know, effort and it shows the commitment that we're making to, to be there for the long haul. Uh, we, we know that it's a transient work uh, environment. We know that people are moving. Uh, to get to their next job, but giving people that, that longevity uh, is also incredibly important when, you, when you've got this kind of commitment and this kind of investment being made. Absolutely. I see that we have a question here. Yeah, this is a question for Jerry with Southern Comfort. Uh, uh, Southern Comfort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Southern Comfort. <laughs> Southern Comfort. It's Over almost that time. Yeah. <laughs> Free well, samples for everybody at, <laughs> downstairs, <here>. courtesy <laughs> of the guy in the green shirt. <laughs> so, um, the question was regarding contingent, uh, you know, contingency plans, right? You talked about that a little bit. What does Southern Comfort look for uh, in terms of um, contingency plans? You can go on forever, right? How do you determine where you need that plan? Maybe speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think always we're looking at what, what are our critical jobs? What are our critical craft? What are the craft that, uh, you know, for us, it's mostly, I would say, it's about manpower. How are you going to find those who only have a certain skill that it's hard to replicate? You know, so for us, it's around, you know, those that have the ability to weld, those, you know, electricians, those who can put up iron and, and, and do specific craft around putting up the big eye beams Again, we're always very specific about what is it that's hard to replicate. So we, again, we may not try to have a contingency for every craft, but we're always conscious in our mind is what is the critical path? What is the critical craft we have? And then we focus on contingencies in that area. Because sometimes you may end up having to rob from Peter to pay Paul and you want to know what's really, really important to you. So again, we're always focused on what's critical path, what's critical craft, and then how are we going to manage that from there? And I would add a little bit to that on the, as the owner's aspect is, is talking with your project management, having that communication open and understanding what your contingency is as a contractor to make sure that we're not doubling, tripling, quadrupling contingency on that project for whether it be weather, manpower, schedule, whatever. Because that's often what we find is that the PM will have, you know, the, the owner PM will have some contingency, the contractor will have contingency. All of a sudden you have 15, 20% baked into this project where if you communicated, you could strip it out, you're more competitive as a contractor and we're more competitive as an owner getting the pipeline or getting the project built. And I think some of that, some of that also is looking at 
you know, who are your partnered contractors that are available to come help? Because I made this comment earlier around being able to, to, to form a collective ecosystem of contract partners that can come running. And so when, when you have a need, who are you gonna call and who's gonna come help you? Who may have captive craft that can come? Who may have people that work in, in uh, the shop that have craft availability? So it's always around where are you gonna go and who are you gonna call and which partners are gonna be available to come take care of you. So you know, to that in New Jersey, we've been seeing them I mean, across the country too with the shortage of labor. Um, our contractors, our key contractors, they're really down to the Z teams, if you will. You know, that we've always relied on them for their A and B teams, the expertise that comes out to, to, to go through exactly what you and Will and, and, and I were just talking about. But for the past five or six years, with the decrease in labor, people that were you know, non-foreman are now general foreman running another crew. And it's very difficult to, to get that buildup on the electric utility end of it. Everybody's working in a high voltage yard and there's a whole set of safety circumstances that get tied into that. But just trying to get them up to speed on, on that when, when you don't have that steady force of labor. So right. that collaboration gets, it's a great, it works great when everybody is, 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 is you know, looking for work, but right now it's a shortage and it's really hurting us from that aspect. Absolutely. I think all of our panelists have raised very important points today. Um, we have maybe two minutes for an additional question. Last call. Okay, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. We got one, oh, we got we got one question. Here? Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Martin Rodriguez, a local 433 business agent, and uh, I was just wondering on some of these projects for the young man, General Motors, uh, are, are they past the, uh, the detailing stage? Or are you still ongoing while you're doing these projects? Uh, where, whereabouts are you on those? Yeah, so we have two raising gangs and three detailing gangs, and we are we are actively detailing on, um, on all of the projects. Though I mean, like, on on Ultium Two in Spring Hill, Tennessee, the project that I'm managing, we are we are detailing. Yes, okay, sir. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, in the past, some of the people think that you know, if you cut out some uh, jobs, that it eliminates uh, work for these guys, and it has you have less manpower, but that. It, that's, in my book, it's always to increase your market share whenever you could streamline a process. And uh, the, some of these projects, like right now in California, there's uh, several different innovative steel techniques that can cut the, uh, the erection time and the manpower on a job by a, at least a third. Uh, it eliminates all the welding as well, you know, uh, as well as brace bases, if uh, bays. You know, if you haven't looked at those technologies and, and you're fast track on these techniques, it, I would be uh, more than glad to talk to you about them. Uh, they're proven okay. and they work. Yeah, let's based right here in California. Awesome. Yeah, let's talk. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things about General Motors and, and with the technology, building classification and the hazards associated with uh, the mixing of the chemicals for batteries has a, has a very high fire rating. Uh, and we've had to look at uh, intumescent paints uh, that go on the steel. That's, that's been a re relatively new technology that we're using to, to try and paint in the shop and bring the steel out uh, that's already rated. Uh, the, the alternative to that would have been the traditional fireproofing that, that nobody really likes to do. It's dirty, it's, it's, it's done late, it, it gets on everything. Uh, so I'm definitely interested in hearing about those, those technological improvements. So thank you. Well, I want to thank today uh, several people. So foremost, our panelists for coming out and making the trip to share their knowledge and expertise and their experiences and answer questions. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'd also like to thank the leadership of the Ironworkers and Impact for making this possible, and specifically Kevin Hilton for ensuring that this panel came together and that we were all able to bring this important topic to you. So thank you again and have a great lunch.